Good afternoon and welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. My name is Jessica Geiger and I am a member of the Dole Institute's Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. The Student Advisory Board is a bipartisan group whose members can access many great opportunities through their involvement. If you are a student and would like to join, please contact, contact us by emailing dolesav at ku.edu. After the presentation, we will have some time for questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able and ask just one brief question. If you have difficult, difficulty hearing during the program, please alert one of our staff members or student volunteers who will assist you. Before we begin, I would like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. Now, please join me in welcoming Senior Associate Director, Dr. Barbara Ballard. Thank you, Jessica, and fine job. Uh, good afternoon, and welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics for the Elizabeth Dole Women in Leadership Lecture with Representative Cherise Davids. Also joining us tonight, or this afternoon, as an honored guest is Reggie Robinson, our Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. He looks surprised. Please stand. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight's uh, panel discussion will be moderated by Bill Lacey, Director of the Dole Institute. We are pleased this evening to host <laughs> Representative Sharice Davids. Representative Davids represents the third district and was sworn into the 116th Congress in January of 2019. She is one of the first two Native American women to serve in Congress. Representative David's career has focused on healthcare, economic, and community development. She was a White House Fellow. It really is an absolute pleasure, first of all, to see so many people here this evening, this afternoon, and I would like to say, please join me in welcoming Representative Sharice Davids. Congresswoman, thanks for uh, coming to the Dole Institute. Welcome to the Dole Institute at KU. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Great. Can you start, we, I like to get a little personal background so everybody knows a little bit more about you personally. Tell us about your upbringing and how you got interested in public service. Um, I think without even realizing it, I probably got interested in public service because my, my mom was in the Army for 20 years. Uh, she served in the Army from before I was born until after I got out of high school. And um, there's actually a lot of people in my family who are, who are veterans. And uh, I think it, it just is kind of gets ingrained in you um, when, you're, when you're part of a military family. Um, I, my, we traveled all over. My mom used to joke that uh, she joined the Army and thought she would see the world. We mostly saw Kansas and Missouri. <laughs> um, so she spent a little bit of time. We were out at Fort Riley. Uh, we, we spent a little bit of time at um, Fort Leonard Wood. She was a drill sergeant there. Got the push-ups to prove it. Um, and, and then she retired while she was stationed at, at Fort Leavenworth. And so I, I graduated from Leavenworth High School and uh, went on to, uh, I'm a first generation college student or former first generation college student. My mom got her bachelor's degree uh, a few year, about three years ago. And um, so, I, I kind of took a pretty windy route. Uh, started off with an associate's at Johnson County Community College. I did go to KU for a little while. Uh, and then I got my bachelor's at UMKC. And then, um, I don't know what other questions you're gonna ask because I don't want to answer all of it. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and then I was fortunate enough to get into to Cornell for law school. And I felt like I hit my stride in life while I was out there. Uh, at, in Ithaca doing my studying law and I came back home to Kansas, worked at a large law firm, did mergers and acquisitions and financing, you know, all the stuff that obviously leads to you wanting to go into public service. 
Um, and then I, I really found a path of uh, community and economic development work. I was out on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota for a little while. And um, while I was there, I realized how little most of us know about the federal government. And I don't mean native communities. I just mean most of us um, don't know the, the role of the federal government, how it functions, who's making decisions. So I decided to apply to be a White House fellow. And I had the chance to spend a year at the Department of Transportation uh, at the end of the Obama administration and the beginning of the current administration. Um, I actually got to talk to the students for a few minutes earlier who are part of the Student Advisory Board. And, um, you know, it's one of those, it's, it's such an interesting thing that our, our government gets, we, um, there are no other gov governments in the world that transition power the way that we do to go from one administration in a peaceful transition to another administration and to get to be in Washington, D.C. when that was going on in a, a secretary's office was uh, a pretty profound experience. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then I ran for Congress. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then we'll, I moved home. We'll, yeah, we'll <laughs> fill in some more yeah. details. Um, you know, your, your biography is so fascinating. Your work in the Native American community, um, your uh, uh, participation in the MMA oh, yeah. and in, in that, and we want you to talk a little bit about that, the fact that you were raised by a single mom who is military, LGBT, all of those things. How do all of those affect your interest in, in uh, public service? That's a, that's a big question. Um, okay, so the, I'm going to touch on the MMA part first because I actually don't talk as much about about uh, mixed martial arts or my martial arts uh, as you would think I would because it's such a huge part of, um, it's, it's actually a huge part of my identity. I feel like I, I started doing martial arts. I was, first of all, I was obsessed with it when I was a kid, but my mom couldn't afford um, to put me into classes. So I, like, obviously I ran around the house watching Bruce Lee movies and kicking and punching all over. Um, but when I was an adult, I was 19 and I started taking martial arts classes because I had a job and I could afford to pay for classes. And um, the amount of growth as a person that I had from uh, the discipline, from learning how to push yourself, from deciding to compete and getting over the hurdle of being scared about competing, um, and then showing up every day when you're getting ready for, uh, you spend eight to 10 weeks getting ready for one 15 minute, uh, one 15 minute fight. And everything about that, whether you win or lose, all of it is made up of all the different little decisions you made the entire time that you were getting ready. And in that way, it was one of the things that prepared me the most for running for office because it's a very similar thing. Every single day you have to get up and do the hard stuff. And if you don't, you're not going to win. Uh, and if you do, it's more likely that you'll win. You're not guaranteed <laughs> to win. Um, so. Uh, I, I, I'm glad you asked me about MMA because it's, it's really a huge piece of, um, a huge piece of my heart. Uh, and then getting into public service with all of the different uh, pieces of professional experience I have, I, I would say that the, the most impactful thing was um, my time doing community and economic development work because it was where I saw uh, the rubber meet the road on uh, how policy impacts. So I worked for a nonprofit and seeing things like how how a definition can inc make it so that an organization is included or excluded from accessing a program, uh, how even how how are the dollars divvied up? You know, is Kansas getting uh, the amount of of funding that it should be based on how much we're sending to DC? Uh, those kinds of things I, I actually got to start seeing because of my nonprofit work. And I think that that was, this, that was probably the time when I first thought about the uh, impact that I could have focusing on policy. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, what led you, what, how did you make your decision to run for Congress? And what were the key factors looking back now that you think um, made you successful in that effort? Um, there weren't any women in the race. 
that was probably the uh, almost like the straw, I guess I would say, because I I think that the idea of running for office. Um, I read a a book once called An Act of Congress, and it's about. I remember when I was reading it, I would tell people, "Oh, I'm reading this really interesting book." It's called An Act of, of Congress, and it's about uh, financial regulatory reform. <laughs> <laughs> it was the Dodd-Frank Act. So um, uh, in that book, they, they talk about how, um, the, how the idea of running for Congress or being in Congress um, used to be more of a, a citizen legislature concept where people would have their professional lives at home. They would spend time in D.C. as the representative for their um, for their home, and then and then go back. And just the evolution of seeing people who are uh, who either didn't have any kind of career except to be in politics, um, and how the type of um, people that we see in Congress, with it being predominantly like. Uh, very, very wealthy people. Um, so I'm reading this book, and I was like, oh, yeah, this is very interesting. Like, we, maybe I should run for office one of these days because I feel like I have a, a, an experience that is not uncommon. It's not uncommon to be raised by a single parent or to be a first-generation college student or uh, to, to grow up as an a army brat. And um, I think that those are the... It's little things like that. It was just a couple of lines in a in a book that I read that got even like had that first spark of maybe I should run for office one of these days. So that was a while ago. And then uh, when I looked at the race, I, there were no women in the race, and I thought, well, surely there's uh, surely there's a, a capable, smart uh, woman who could at least be in the race. I felt like we were doing our, ourselves a disservice as a community if. We didn't have any options, so um, obviously I recruited somebody. I was trying to recruit people to, <laughs> to get into the race. And then um, my federal experience was one of, the, uh, one of the pieces when I thought, well, if I don't find somebody uh, and I'm going to ask the question, who's going to do something about this, then I should consider whether or not I can be part of the answer to that question. Uh, and I had more federal experience than uh, the other people who were in the race. And I, I, I talked to a bunch of people, and I feel like we, there was a few of us who sat down at a kitchen table and decided, okay, I can't find anybody else, and I think that we're, I think I can be part of doing something about this. So I decided to get in, and it turned out pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't have been better, I don't think, Congresswoman. Um, Take a moment to describe the learning curve that you face as a new member of the House. It's very, very steep. Um, so I, I actually feel very fortunate, although I was on the executive side because I was at um, transportation, I feel very fortunate that I had the opportunity to even spend just a little bit of time out in D.C. And um, one, I showed up knowing that... Uh, you can kind of know how things work. Like, we know how a bill becomes a law, but uh, there's how things happen, and then there's how things happen. So one of the learning curves is just getting a feel for how do all the, like, how do all the committees interact with each other? What do you do when you have a massive piece of legislation and uh, four committees have jurisdiction over it? It turns out uh, D.C. is a very hierarchical place. Surprise, surprise. Um, and as a as the freshman member from Kansas, a lot of my learning curve has been figuring out who's working on key pieces of legislation, uh, who's been doing that for a really long time, um, how 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 do decisions get made in this institution? The Congress has been it's building up for hundreds of years, and um, I take it very seriously that I have to really understand the fundamentals and the foundation um, to be able to become an effective legislator. And it's a, it's a lot. There are 20 committees. Um, it's also a lot learning how, the, um, how do the 
uh, Democrats and Republicans come together on which issues and start to push things forward. Uh, it's also hard to remember all 434 of my, uh, of my colleagues, so that's one of the piece. And then you have to build out a whole team. So when you're running, you have a team who's helping you get elected, but uh, there's running for office and then there's uh, being the representative. And so we had to staff up. We have two district offices, one in Johnson County, one in Wyandotte County. Um, and it's still the federal government, so you have to figure out how to navigate the bureaucracy of getting an office open. Um, and all our whole team is learning uh, all of these things as we're kind of building the plane as we're flying it. Which maybe I should make that joke as a part of the aviation subcommittee. <laughs> Okay, um, you seem to be, from, from what I've read and heard, uh, more centrist than some of your colleagues, uh, especially new colleagues in the House Democratic Caucus, and I know you've joined the New Democratic Coalition. What are the key principles of that group? Yeah, the New Dems, <clears throat> well, so it's uh, interesting because I just got to spend a bit of time with some folks who are part of the New Dem Coalition uh, talking about uh, a few different issues, uh, health care is a huge, it's a huge issue and the New Dems are taking that very seriously. Um, so some of it has to do with the fact that the issues that they're focusing on, uh, climate issues is another one, workforce development is another one, and infrastructure. And uh, at some point, I'm sure I'll like stand up and start waving my arms out of excitement for infrastructure. Um, but. Some of it has to do with that. What, what are the things that, that the New Dem uh, or New Democrat uh, coalition is focusing on? Um, but the, I guess the framework piece is probably the part that uh, attracted me the most to, the, to that caucus, and it's because um, they're really interested in getting stuff done. And I consider myself to be a very pragmatic person um, and I often say I wouldn't, I wouldn't have seen the success in my career uh, that I've had if I, if I wasn't pragmatic. Uh, you know, that means we have to sometimes do things either that we don't want to do, getting up super early, studying late into the night, do, working multiple jobs. Um, also, I can't, I can't solve every single problem, and I can't be, and, and I don't think that uh, being the, um, it's just not in my personality type to be the person who is like uh, the most, uh, I don't know if aggressive is the right word, but it's something like that. Like I want to, I want to figure out how do, what do you care about? What do you care about? What do I care about? Okay, well, where can we meet and how can we get something done from that? And the New Dem Coalition really does a lot of that. We bring in um, speakers, this is another piece that they do that's really helpful. They help educate the members in the caucus about, um, we'll have a panel of people who have uh, three different views on how we address one specific uh, policy issue. And um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how the other caucuses work, but the fact that we have multiple ideas and views um, in front of us from the experts is something that I think it, leads us to better policy. Uh, because we're not gonna agree on every single thing, but there's no way we know if we're, doing, we're coming up with the best policy if we only know one point of view. And uh, the New Dems is really helps with that, so. Okay. Yeah. Um, and maybe, you, you, I think you kind of reference this uh, in a couple of, of answers, uh, but what is your policy focus? Now, if you wanna talk about infrastructure, it's a great time. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, well, the first thing is that I'll bring up, and I, I kind of mentioned healthcare is a, a top issue. It, it's the thing that I didn't realize this when I started my campaign, but healthcare over the course of that campaign, it was very clearly the number one issue that people were concerned about. It was, it came up, it didn't matter if I was talking to uh, younger people, more experienced people. Uh, it didn't matter if I was in a room with, um, I'm often in rooms with people who, it's not always just Democrats in the room uh, when I was running especially. Uh, and 
it didn't, it, none of that mattered. It didn't matter what the socioeconomic makeup of the group, the party makeup, the gender makeup, everybody was either concerned about the cost, concerned about deductibles, or not having insurance, or wanting to start a business and not being, not feeling like they could. Um, so that's been a pretty big uh, focus area. We're constantly looking for bills from to support. I've co-sponsored like 25, uh, it's probably a couple more than that, um, healthcare related bills. And then personally, I'm very interested in um, figuring out ways to increase access to mental and behavioral health services. Um, and then infrastructure, transportation and infrastructure is my, um, I call myself a born again transportation enthusiast because the, when I was at the Department of Transportation, the thing, that I, the thing that really struck me was that our infrastructure and transportation systems, they touch every aspect of our life. How do we get to work or our, our places of worship, get our kids to school, get to health care? Uh, all of these different things are impacted by the, by the policies that we're putting forward. Uh, it also touches on issues of climate change. It touches on issues of um, like equity in our society and making sure that uh, everybody can access those opportunities. And if we're really intentional about it, the right now we're we're operating on the infrastructure that our grandparents built, and uh, we have the opportunity right now to build an infrastructure that will help our grandchildren thrive in their jobs, in their um, family lives. And I think about that a lot in the, in the policies that we're, that we're working on. And, um, and then I would say the other, it's not, it's not quite a policy uh, priority. It, it's more of an accessibility priority. So I know I already mentioned we have two offices. Uh, we have one in Wyandotte and one in Johnson. And um, I opened a Wyandotte County office because uh, you know, the, I, I took over my predecessor's office for continuity. There are lots of people who don't know that their member of Congress changed, but they know that's the place they go for federal stuff. And, um, and so I, the phone number is the same, the address is the same, and I wanted people to not, um, to, to not have to figure out, well, where's the office now, and um, who's, who's David? And, uh, and so, so, Accessibility, I think, is really important. The people in Wyandotte, um, the entire county, shouldn't have to drive all the way to Overland Park. And, um, and then we're doing pop-up office hours. So we, we go out into the um, places. You know, folks in like Gardner or Spring Hill shouldn't have to drive all the way up to Overland Park to get services from their member of Congress. And um, we help people with disability and social security. Uh, the constituent services piece is super important to our office. In fact, we built out the, uh, the district offices before we, finished, um, before we finished all of the hiring for the uh, DC office uh, because we wanted to make sure that we got the constituent services piece right. Because for a freshman member, that's a place where you can immediately be a, a positive impact for your uh, constituents. What does it mean, Congresswoman, to be to you to be one of the first Native American women elected to the House? I, I don't know yet. <laughs> I think I'm probably gonna. Uh, I'll probably be processing what that means for a really long time. It's, it's really. I mean, of course, it's, it feels like an honor. And then to be able to, uh, to have uh, Deb Haaland, who was elected in New Mexico, um, for the two of us to be there feels, uh, I always say, I don't, I don't know what it would be like if she wasn't there uh, for both of us to be experiencing this uh, together. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, and I think that, it doesn't hit me all that often, except when uh, I get to talk to Native youth a, a, a good amount. And, and I think when I do that, I realize how, uh, how imp impactful it can be. Um, and then when I talk to my mom <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> and the two of us are having conversations, and um, you know, 
in fact, my, my mom and I sometimes will be driving places and I'll be like, can you believe I'm a member of Congress? And, um, and like my mom would, she's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's, it, it's just, um, it's, it's going to take me a long time, I think, to figure out like the emotional impact of it. Um, but I, I feel very fortunate. And also, I will say this too. I'm really, I, one of the things that I remember, it was probably a couple of weeks after the election, and I was going around and meeting people in DC because you go and do the orientation process pretty quickly. And I would be introducing myself to people. Hi, I'm Sharice, uh, third, third district in Kansas. And they, Kansas? And then, um, and, and I just remember thinking, how awesome is it that, like, our state got to be part of this historic thing. We got to be part of uh, electing the first Native American woman to Congress. And that, uh, I don't know why, but I think it's because when I went to Cornell for law school, a lot of people just had no idea, they don't know anything about Kansas. And I remember the, the number of people that would be like, oh, what's that like? <laughs> and I o my first question is always, have you been there? And usually, if, if somebody's like, what's that like? Um, seriously, somebody asked me one time if we had like dirt roads all over. I, and, um, and I was like, you should come visit. So I'm just always asking people, come, come, come visit Kansas. Because um, if you're wondering, what is that like in that way, then you probably have not visited and not had the chance to get to know or meet people here or see the place. And um, I think that makes, I think it makes a huge impact on, um, uh, on people when they get the chance to come visit. Because we, if, and, unless they've been here before, I guarantee people that they're, I always say, you know, like, your, your expectations will be exceeded. You should come see us. <laughs> OK. Um, could you talk a little bit about the grind it is to serve in the house and the travel mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. daily schedule and all of that and, and, and how you cope with that? Uh, that's a good word, the grind. Um, so it's really important to have a really good team around me uh, helping with all helping with all kinds of things. Uh, part of how I cope with it is that they uh, they really make sure that I, because I'll just work and work and work. Um, I, I'll, I forget to eat sometimes, so, you know, they'll, they have snacks all the time. They're like, here's a banana. Um, it's, the reason that it's such a grind is that there's so much work to be done, and the days start you know, we'll start at 8 o'clock with meetings, and we'll do a bunch of back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back meetings. Then you have to run and vote. This is just, but while you're in D.C., then you run and vote, uh, come back. There's probably, um, I mean, then we have to, uh, I'm very concerned always about making sure that we allot enough time for uh, legislative, uh, our legislative agenda, what's going on for the week, what are our long-term goals. And then, and then there's, there's so many things going on. It's really, well, I'll say one of the most disappointing things about this is there's always so many cool things and I only get to go to a couple of them. <laughs> and uh, usually you get to show up for, I mean, you probably know this, you get to show up for uh, 30 minutes and then you have to run to the next thing. And, um, and I, I got the chance to speak at a conference and on the way in, I was thinking, oh, it's been a long time since I, you learn a lot in conferences. Well, I mean, you can. And, uh, and I, I, don't, I don't get to, I don't get to like sit and listen to experts in their field for an hour long panel where they're, you know, going at it, and trying to figure out what the right direction is. Um, but the coping is, a lot of it is just really trusting my team and, uh, and then listening to them too when they say like, hey, you should take Sunday morning off. And I'm like, OK, OK, I will. Uh, but it's, it's the steep learning curve. 
and the volume of work that needs to get done. Then when we're back in the district, I mean, I get to do stuff like this. Um, but we have, I mean, a lot of it is me asking people to meet with me on the weekends because I fly out to D.C. on Monday morning on the earliest flight, which is so I get to the airport about 5 in the morning. And then I usually come home on either Thursday night or Friday, and then I'm home for the weekend. We do as, you know, either events or constituent meetings, and then I fly back on Monday morning. And um, so it just, it, it means that when I'm at home in the district, we have to really maximize the amount of time that I get to see constituents. Okay. Let's talk about some issues that uh, you face in the House. And let's start with the big one, which is the impeachment process. Kind of describe your attitude about that and what you think the next steps are. Um, that's an interesting way you asked that, my attitude about it. Uh, so, well, first of all, I would say my overarching um, attitude and kind of feelings and em emotions about it are that it's um, it's actually like a, 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 a sad thing to me. Um, and that's because I feel like the, in a lot of ways, it's like the, the, the way things feel right now, uh, we're at a 10 all the time. And, and that's a, a rough place for our country to be in. Um, and I, I feel like I, I, I would love for us to just be able to like breathe and um, and around this topic that's really that's a really hard thing uh, because it elicits a lot of emotion from people and um, I feel like I'm glad that I'm a lawyer <laughs> because in some ways when you uh, in law school they always say you you learn to think like a lawyer in law school. You don't learn to be a lawyer necessarily, but you learn how to think like a lawyer. And um, this is the approach that I take is one of, um, it's, I'm a process-oriented person. Every decision I make, uh, I, I, I want to have a process around it. So if I'm going to co-sponsor something, if I'm going to vote yes or no on something, if I'm going to vocalize support or not, then I have to have a decision-making process because, um, one, I think that's what people expect. They want to know, how did you make your decision? And um, around this issue, I think that, um, how, I, don't I don't remember now if it was, it's probably been four weeks or so, three or four weeks, uh, when the president and the White House put out the approximation of the phone call, um, I, I I felt as though I had no other uh, direction to go, seeing that this was literally the the document that they said was like presumably the best view of this conversation. And uh, our president asked another president from a foreign country to to uh, investigate a political rival. And uh, I think the impeachment inquiry was, uh, I felt like I didn't have a choice based on the oath that I took uh, when I got sworn in to Congress to protect and defend the Constitution. And, um, and I think that the next steps and where we're at now is finding out exactly, because that was an approximation. Um, and the inquiry is ongoing. Uh, I don't sit on the committees that uh, have jurisdiction over that process. Um, but with the inquiry ongoing, I think that um, probably the big question that a lot of people uh, wonder is, uh, how are you going to vote? And all I can say is, like every other decision that I make, I will, I will not sign on to a bill or a resolution or co-sponsor something until our office has seen the language of the, of the bill uh, or the resolution. And y you might be surprised at the number of time we, times we get asked to co-sponsor stuff when they're like, oh, we don't have the language yet. Like, I'm not. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I 
when the time comes, uh, if it comes, like I won't make my decision until I've seen the writing that I'm going to be voting on. And that's true of bills, resolutions, or in anything else that's included. Okay, the administration recently uh, pulled our forces out of Syria. Um, how does that concern you? Do you believe the Kurds are our allies, and does that decision concern you? Yes. Um, I was really concerned uh, almost immediately, and not because I, uh, uh, I don't claim any expertise in foreign affairs, but I immediately started to, um, I mean, I know, I, I probably know more than uh, a lay person who's not paying, it, who's not really like, that's not the thing they're paying attention to. Um, but we did a lot of, uh, a lot of checking. We uh, reached out to some experts um, and uh, yes, I, the, the Kurds uh, stood by us and fought as allies in the efforts against ISIS. And um, I was one of the people who uh, signed on and then voted to uh, condemn the decision to, to pull forces out of Syria um, because, I, because it was unplanned and when I say that, I don't just mean there hadn't been a future plan about just pulling the troops out. There also was not a future plan about what we do if it, the region uh, begins to destabilize. And my, w w I have two big concerns. One is the long-term effect of, um, in a lot of ways, breaking our word to an ally. And then the other is uh, that this makes it that much more likely that there will be a reemergence of, uh, of ISIS, and that is a very dangerous thing. Okay. Uh, Politico had this headline on Friday. I'm just curious about your thoughts on this. The headline was, Warren and Sanders race to outleft each other, and <laughs> moderates are terrified. <laughs> now, are you concerned about... The possibility that the Democratic nominee may be so far to the left that it gets in the way of defeating the president? Uh, well, as soon as you said Politico headline, I was like, uh oh, where are we going with this? <laughs> um, I hadn't seen that headline before. Two, I always say this two things. Um, so, first, I actually, I'm glad you asked the question the way you did. Am I, wor am I scared? I think you said, am I, are you afraid that they're going to? Mm -hmm. So I think too many decisions get made out of a place of fear right now. There are a lot of people who are, are, are scared. And I think there's a lot of people who are completely justified in the fear that they have about um, a lot of different things. But one of the, one of the places where I, I think that um, it's so important for me as a decision maker in the House is that I'm able to just stop and breathe and not um, and not operate from a place of fear or frustration uh, because that inhibits my ability to I think to process the information that's coming in. Um, so I'm not afraid. I think that as it relates to the 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 presidential election in general. Uh, well, first, everybody at the very beginning would ask me, who are you going to endorse in the presidential? And um, I would always say, well, I checked with my mom. She's not running, <laughs> so I don't have to wade into it. Um, I, act, I think that, I think as it relates to, to the, the presidential, that's such a different kind of politics that they're, um, that they're concerned about, because it's a national race. And as a member of the House, I have the lucky, I, I mean, it, it, we're the closest to the constituents that we have. When you're uh, a, a statewide, like a senator, your, your constituency is an entire state. For me, it's, it's the third district. And the third district will make their, and, and all of Kansas will make their decision about which presidential candidate 
uh, they support in the in the primary, and uh, I hope that I hope that the Democratic Party listens when Kansas makes their opinion about that known because I think that our state is uh, we're we're oftentimes a number of years ahead of the of where the country is going. Um, we, I would say, saw some more extreme policies for a little while, and we're moving back towards some pragma pragmatic, <laughs> uh, some pragmatic elected officials, and uh, and I, th I think that the country would do much better to look toward look toward Kansas as a um, kind of a a leader in in what direction the the party should be going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I'm not scared. I'm not scared. Yeah. Looking back at your background and all the fascinating things that you've been through in your life already, what would you say about how those things prepared you to be a better congresswoman? Mm. I think a lot of my experiences helped me learn how to listen better. And some of that is my, we didn't even get into the 150 jobs I had during my eight years getting my undergrad. But um, I spent a lot of time, I worked at Sonic for like five years. Um, and yes, I roller skated. <laughs> uh, and um, I think some of, the, some of the skills that I have that help in the role that I have right now actually came from my time working in the service industry. And it's because uh, a lot of times you, if, as long as you don't come into, the, into an interaction with a, with a customer um, assuming that you're already right and they're already wrong, you can have a productive conversation and everybody can leave feeling much better. Um, and I think that, that that kind of like service mindset, even though it was at like Sonic and the Marriott and you know, I was a bartender and um, th that really helped prepare me. And then I think that in the other, like working at a big law firm prepared me to work long hours <laughs> um, and to be very detail oriented. Um, you have to be very detail oriented uh, for this. Well, I do. Uh, every member is different. And then um, I think it also helped me interact with a lot of people with different experiences. And so did my mom being in the Army. You know, you show up to a new school when you're like 12, and uh, everybody wants to be liked, nobody wants to show up to a new school and, and not make friends. And uh, I think that helped me with recognizing that everybody shows up and doesn't, nobody wants to be disliked. So you show up and um, one of the things that I always try to do and I ask our, our team in our office is uh, when someone walks through the door, uh, I want them to feel like they're in the right place. Even if we're not, even if we don't agree on everything, even if it turns out the issue that they're facing is a state issue, and we should, you know, s like help them get in touch with somebody uh, in the state government. But I, but I want to make sure that people show up and they feel like, okay, I'm supposed to be here. And I often tell people when they come to visit us in D.C., uh, this building. I mean, those those build. It's like intimidating the first time you go to a federal building in D.C. They're massive, they're old, it's historic, the decisions that have been made there. Um, but that building is as much anybody, it's your building as much as it is mine, as much as it is anybody else um, uh, here. And I think that having that mindset probably comes from showing up places and being like, I hope, some, I, hope I can make a f couple of friends here on the first day. Um, so those are probably the, uh, a good smattering of how the experience of experiences have influenced my ability to do this job. Mm -hmm. uh, you've referenced this today. I've seen it in some of your comments in the media, the importance of having some degree of bipartisanship 
How important is that to you, and what does Bob Dole's record say to you about that as well? I think, it, I mean, I think lasting policy has to be bi bi bipartisan. Um, it has to include um, as, as many people coming together as possible because uh, otherwise you end up in a situation of um, one group of people has power and, the other, and then when they pass a bunch of policies, they leave and the other group has power, then they're going to undo those. And, and I think that if we want, if what we actually want is lasting policy, then it has, it has to be bi bipartisan. Um, and I think, I think that we have, um, we have, like a, Bob Dole is an amazing example of, um, like even, even now, people will talk about, you know, oh, remember, and they'll name a, just a couple of people who have impacted this, whole, the whole country, who have impacted the country in a positive way uh, because of their ability to reach across the aisle, because of their ability to um, find those places where uh, folks can come together and agree on, uh, on policy. And uh, Bob Dole is always one of the people that, that folks bring up. And um, I mean, it's a, it's a point of pride for me. I was just saying earlier that I, get the, I got to go to um, hit the ceremony for his uh, um, uh, promotion. So he was uh, uh, promoted um, recently. I don't remember. It, it was a few months ago. And the level of respect that he evokes and... Um, and in a lot of ways, uh, commands, but is bestowed on him by so many people, uh, Democrats and Republicans, is, um, I just think that that's, it's one of the reasons I, I'm excited that we have the Dole Institute here in Kansas. I know it doesn't get to be in the district I represent, but, um, or I don't get to represent the district that it's in, but um, it's, it, it's, it's one of those things where uh, I just feel very fortunate to, um, in a little way, because I'm a, in politics in Kansas, I get to be associated even with the with that level of respect that people have for for a truly bipartisan and um, consensus builder. Was there any time on the campaign, from the very beginning to the very end? that you got up one morning and said, why did I do this? When he started with, was there any time on the camp? I was like, what is coming? Um, I don't remember ever waking up and wondering, why did I, why did I do this? The campaign was actually, um, like a lot of tough things that you do, you find out a lot about yourself. <clears throat> you find out a lot about yourself when you're r when you run for office. Uh, you find out whether or like what are you truly committed to. Um, I think in a lot of ways, uh, running for office is an exercise in um, in uh, taking critique and criticism and. If you're really solid in your, like, why am I doing this? Um, then it, it really helps. And um, I remember asking my mom once about uh, uh, joining the military. <clears throat> and I had considered joining the military. Uh, I didn't end up doing, when I was, I think I was about 19, um, the don't ask, don't tell policy was still in place. And so, uh, I ended up not not joining, but I, I had a very serious conversation with my mom, and I asked her about uh, about you know what do you what what should a person be thinking about if they're thinking of of joining the military? And she said, well, it depends on uh, you should be thinking about why you're doing it. Would you be doing it because it's a, s a steady job? Would you be doing it because um, 
you can, your school, they can help pay for your school? Would you be doing it because you want to learn a specific skill set? Are you doing it because you want to serve your country? And like my mom always does, I was like, wow, that's a, you're right. So this feels like when you run for office, it feels like that. For what purpose are you doing this? And um, I, during the campaign, felt like this is, this is a flashpoint in our country's history. I think we're trying to figure out who we are. Um, and uh, I get the chance to be a part of that. You know, in, in the United States, if you want to see different policies, if you want to see um, your, your government doing one thing or another, you, you get to have a say in that. And it can be by voting, it can be by um, reaching out to your elected officials, and it can be by running. And um, I, thought about, I thought about those things a, a lot. But I never woke up wondering why I did it. That's probably a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Kansas City Star recently ran a very interesting piece about how your election has inspired a number of women locally to throw their hats in the ring and run for office. How does that make you feel and speak to the importance of more women actually seeking various levels of elected office? I was kind of blown away when I found out how many people who volunteered on our campaign uh, were running for office in a good way, in a good way. And, um, you know, I got the chance to talk to the, the reporter who wrote that article, and uh, she asked me uh, a similar question about inspiring people to run. And I... I, I actually don't, I actually, I mean, I, I don't know if they would consider it this way. I, I don't actually consider it as being an inspiration for uh, people to, to run. I think so much of it has to do with that people had that spark in them already. Uh, they, it, whatever, the, whatever the, the stuff is that pushes somebody to say, you know what, I'm going to run for office, that was already there. I think that the act of doing something like going around and knocking on doors or calling people, because for a lot of people, it was the first time they ever, they ever did that. And it's a very uncomfortable thing <laughs> to go, especially this day and age, right? You knock on the door. If somebody knocks on your door, you're like, <laughs> you check your phone. Did I plan on having somebody come over? Um, and, and I think that a lot of people just saw it as a possibility. Like maybe hadn't just hadn't even didn't even occur to them before that, maybe I should run for office, um, and that to me was the the. That's how I think about it. Is that there's so many people like there's a bunch of people in the this room right now probably who, uh, might not have ever thought maybe I should run for office, and then, all it takes is that one little spark, and and then you think, yeah. I care what happens on my school board, and um, and then and then next thing you know, you've got a whole bunch of people who are who are running for all kinds of things. Uh, it's a it, it's it's really amazing to see. Um, I think that w having women running for office is. I mean, I think it's important because our our experiences and voices are important in the in the policy and I think it's important because uh, the number is so uh, it's depressed from the actual it's it, actual um, percentage of the population that we make up even if if that was the only reason I think that would be a good a good reason for women to to be running but I just I personally know tons of amazing smart driven uh, uh, service-oriented women and would love to see them running for office all over the place. Mm -hmm. This is the Elizabeth Dole lecture and I'm just wondering what thoughts that you have on her legacy of public service. You know one of the things that um, that I was thinking about while we were on the way over here was 
uh, about how, like, I know she didn't, I know she represented a different, uh, as a senator, a different state, but the, the ability for me to sit here and be a member of Congress is possible because there were so many women who uh, held cabinet positions, who were senators, who um, really like carved that space out. And um, I think uh, Elizabeth Dole is one of those people that you can point to and say, there was a lot of groundbreaking that happened um, that it's, it's easy for people to not see the, the direct line, but there's a direct line between, uh, you know, I mean, even when in, I don't know, 10 years from now, it's, an, it's a completely normal thing for people to say, oh, the Elizabeth Dole uh, lecture series is going on. She held all these amazing positions. She occupied this space in the highest levels of our federal government. And that's a totally normal thing. And I think that's the kind of stuff that um, you know, for folks like me, uh, I, I benefit both from people that I've, that I've heard of and um, have admiration for, and also from tons of people who, whose names we'll never know, but I know that their work in uh, office spaces, their work in schools, their work um, in their homes is part of why I get to be a member of Congress now. Um, yeah. Okay. I have one final question, then we'll open it up to a few minutes of uh, questions from our audience. Um, can you uh, just take a moment, Congresswoman, to speak to the young people here today and tell them about the importance uh, of getting into public service? It's important. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that uh, one of the things, when I, I said this earlier, I got the chance to sit down with the student advisory uh, board earlier, and um, in response to, to the question about involvement, uh, it made me think about how often uh, elected officials and political leaders don't listen to uh, the experiences and voices of, of young people. And I think that that is, uh, it's something that uh, has been uh, a failing of, of our larger institutions for sure, um, and probably a lot of our smaller institutions like our school systems sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes. And um, the cool thing is that with, and actually I see you have a March for Our Lives shirt on, I'm sorry, I'm not going to. Stand up. No, I'm kidding. Don't, don't. You don't. I'm just kidding. But I think that one of the things that we're seeing is the collectively as a society, we're actually highlighting the young people who are showing up, who are trying to make their voices heard. Um, and I think March for Our Lives is actually a really great example of that. It's an example of where uh, the media was covering the work that they were doing and um, and that's a that's a great example. It's not the only example, and I think that those kinds of um, those kinds of movements from young people help raise the awareness of elected officials and people in decision making positions that uh, there's an experience here that we need to be paying attention to and listening to, and I think my hope is that the young people that are starting to get engaged will see that it actually matters. Um, it matters if you're showing up. It matters if you're um, uh, calling your member of Congress or showing up to your school board meetings. And, um, and that also, uh, this is just my, probably my pitch because of my concern about the, um, the ability of the federal government to attract young people to work for our departments and agencies that the, the federal government actually serves are really some really important uh, uh, purposes. Uh, and if you're concerned about climate change, um, you know, going to, going to see what's the EPA, like what jobs are at the EPA or um, 
or even at transportation. Transportation actually can have a really amazing impact on, um, on uh, climate change issues. I think that that engagement and, and involvement, it requires both people who are in elected positions to try to figure out ways to engage young people, but it also, uh, it's absolutely dependent on um, once, you've, once you've started uh, down that path to kind of stick with it. And not all young people always have the opportunity to uh, meet their member of Congress or um, the opportunity to go to a school board meeting, but if you've got it, it it's, it's, can be a really cool thing and can really shape the way that the de current decision makers are, uh, are thinking about issues and problems. Okay, if you have a question, raise your hand. We have two students with mics. Please wait for one of the students with a mic to get to you. And uh, we have about 13 minutes, so. I'll try to keep it short. Hello, good to see you. Um, hi, Representative uh, Davids. I wanted to ask, since you talked about being like a reborn transportationist, about, um, Secretary of Transportation Elaine Chow, especially with her like relationship with her husband Mitch McConnell and like the amount of federal funding going to Kentucky from the Department of Transportation. Wow, you just got right into it. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thanks for the question. Uh, it's true, I do consider myself a born again transportation enthusiast. Um, so a couple of things that I'll say uh, is I think right now we're in a place where we're kind of re-examining what uh, various uh, familial relationships look like uh, amongst some of the highest leaders in our country. Um, and, uh, and that doesn't need, and I don't actually, I think that w when we're thinking about that stuff, it needs to be not based on one specific person or, 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 um, uh, or incident or area or anything like that. I think we just need to be thinking about how do we make sure that the decisions that we're making as a government are um, fair and equitable and um, the, I'm not, I haven't been part of the conversations with the TNI uh, committee staff or the chairman, uh, but the, I know that they're, uh, they're starting to, um, the committee is starting to look at the grants and those sorts of things. And um, up to this point, I haven't been, I haven't been part of that. The uh, oversight function of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee um, includes a lot of things. So far, I've just dealt with a GSA, so the people who manage our leases. There's a lot of federal leases out there. Um, and then the, the Boeing, uh, Boeing oversight has actually been taking up a lot of a lot of my time. Okay, we have a question back here, and then I think this gentleman has a question next. Uh, yes, uh, Congressman Congresswoman Davids, um, I believe you said that transportation can have a tremendous impact on climate change and the environment. Could you give us a few examples of? Uh, that kind of uh, impact and uh, some examples of things you're working on which if enacted would have a positive impact on the environment and climate change? Yeah, so uh, on the T&I committee we have jurisdiction over, uh, over a, a lot of things that, uh, first of all, transportation is the highest, uh, the sector that has the uh, highest uh, emissions and um, uh, is causing a lot of uh, climate change, uh, is, is contributing to a lot of climate change issues. Um, so the few things that I can tell you that I'm working on um, or that we've passed, uh, in terms of stuff that we've been passing, a lot of it is uh, around water. So uh, we have, I wish this had been on uh, C-SPAN or something. Uh, about three weeks ago, we passed uh, six bills out of the uh, out of the committee, out of the TNI committee, uh, addressing uh, restoration and maintenance of estuaries. 
And um, if you would have, if you would have been in the uh, hearing or watching it, if they had been showing it on C-SPAN, you wouldn't know if it was a Democrat or a Republican that was talking about the importance of restoration and maintenance of our estuaries. Every single person that talked about um, about the importance of uh, of clean water and our ecosystem, uh, it, it, it was it was actually like very heartening. If you, and I was sitting there thinking, I wish this was on C-SPAN so everybody could see it. Um, and then, so, so a lot of it so far has had to do with um, uh, water issues, clean, clean water issues. The, I just started conversations with some folks about how we can update our, uh, this is so nerdy, update our building codes. So the federal government has such a huge inventory. The number of federal buildings that, the, that we have is just, it's, it's mind boggling. And the building codes have not been updated since the 80s. So our, so our uh, standards for um, the kind, I mean, the technology has changed so much. Our standards for resilience and green technology um, and sustainability are, are so different now than they were then that uh, I, I, I think that just in terms of the kind of legislation that I can introduce and get passed and get bipartisan support on, this is one of those places. And the effect of, uh, of bringing our federal buildings um, into the 21st century and looking forward to how we make sure that they're more sustainable and, and res resilient uh, is gonna have a really, really big impact. It's the thing right now that I'm, I'm working on that I'm, I'm pretty excited about. Okay, we have a question right here. Oh. Um, being a lawyer, you're familiar with the American principle, innocent until proven guilty. But with this president, ever since he's been elected, there have been people calling for impeachment. First, it was before even the Russia investigation, but then it was the Russia investigation. And then now we've got the Ukraine investigation where the president of Ukraine himself said he didn't feel pressured. So how can you um, really say that this is not just a political hit job um, being done, basically people just looking for an excuse to impeach a duly elected president? Um, and why is there such a double standard for this president as opposed to past presidents? Um, so, I don't disagree with you that there were people who were talking about the impeachment um, process and moving forward with that uh, before, in some instances, before they even took office. <laughs> um, but I'm not one of those people. I, uh, I have been, I actually think that uh, it makes it, uh, it, it makes it a weak argument if you don't wait for the, the process and the facts and the information. And this is what I was saying about being a, a, a lawyer and having the thinking like a lawyer. Um, so, I mean, I, I agree with you that there are a, a bunch of people who were talking about it before, uh, either before they took office or uh, before they got uh, the facts, whether it was the Mueller report or um, uh, any of the other facts that have been coming out. Uh, I can't speak for my colleagues and how they make decisions, um, and that's on the Democrat or Republican side because there's going to be people who agree or disagree with uh, with all 435 of us. Um, and the thing that I try to do is make sure that I can explain my process, um, regardless of the maybe frustrations that any one of us might have with our colleagues on any given day. Um, and operating in a way that I feel like makes sure that I'm staying true to uh, what I believe are the reasons that people elected me, uh, my pragmatism, my decision-making ability, is the way that I think I will continue to be uh, a, a strong representative for my district. Um, but, I mean, I, I definitely take your point. I think there, uh, there are 
sometimes people who maybe aren't as process oriented as I am. Okay, we have a question back here. Congresswoman, thank you for being here today. Um, you were, about an hour ago, you were telling us a story. I think you were on a reservation in South Dakota and you learned the impact that a single definition can have in regards to excluding or including a group of people when legislation is written and passed. Did that uh, alter your idea of, of the role of government in any way or change how you go about the process? Hmm. When you say role of government, what are you thinking about? Well, for me personally, um, so I'm in a financial world, and every time a law is passed, we kind of do a happy dance because we know we're going to make more money. Um, and so when you're talking about you saw a definition be written that excluded a group of people or might have included a group of people, did that make you realize, did that make you think in any way that how difficult it is to think forward and to write that legislation in a way that is going to have the least amount of unintended consequences? Or, you know, did it make you think maybe we should, you know, be a little more careful as to how much legislation we pass because there are, there's no way to counter these unintended okay. consequences? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, so, when I, when I said that, what I was thinking about is the way that the uh, unintended consequences is actually a really good, a really good phrase because, um, I think that it ties to the, to the listening piece for elected officials or people who are creating policy. So not just the decision maker, but also all the people who are contributing to the, to the policy that, the, um, that we all end up voting on. Um, when, I, when I think about the definitions, a lot of times what ends up happening is um, sometimes, sometimes it's a, I guess sometimes people make more, more, more money, but I, what I was thinking about is that uh, sometimes programs or um, services are uh, clearly intended to be for um, the use of a, a specific, um, you know, whether it's a, affordable housing or, um, uh, in, so I actually worked on a couple of infrastructure uh, projects through the USDA, they have a rural development um, program and what would end up happening is uh, there would be like a nonprofit doing work and the definition was limited to only uh, county governments or state governments could access the um, uh, low cost financing or something. And um, in very rural areas, sometimes that's, that's, not, uh, that's just not possible because a county government might not have the resources to do a project, but a coalition of uh, the county government and a nonprofit and somebody else might be able to. Um, and so that's, it's, those are the kinds of things that I was thinking more about. Um, and then now that I've been doing this, the, th the biggest thing I've seen is that I, I, I have to try to figure out how, who do I talk to to avoid those unintend, unin unintended consequences. And, um, that, that part is actually the hardest part because you don't know what you don't know. And um, rules and regulations often impact people in ways, uh, uh, second and third order impacts that, that no one even thought about. Okay, well we're out of time, but I want to um, thank you all for coming today and please join me in thanking the Congresswoman for our, no, we're out of time, I'm sorry. Thank you very much for joining us Thank today. You.